ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> Two years ago, I had the privilege of speaking in your fair city for the first time. And I had the privilege of addressing the Catholic people on the topic, what in the name of God is happening to our Catholic Church? And a year ago, I came back and I spoke on the topic, how much more do we have to expect and do we have to take? Today, I'm no longer asking the question, what in the name of God is happening to our Catholic Church? Because it is clear to anyone by now what's happening to our Catholic Church. Neither am I asking anymore, close quotandem, how much more do we have to take? How much more do we have to expect? Because there isn't much more to expect, because the destruction of our Catholic Church, humanly speaking, is just about accomplished. Today, my topic is, are we going to become conciliar church members, or are we going to remain Catholic church members? This is the problem which every Catholic has to solve today. Conciliar or Catholic? Conciliar is a name I did not invent. It is the name which the new breed clergy, with their headquarters in Holland, and with a strong United States section at work right here, it is the name they give themselves. One of their active tools of brainwashing is a regular publication sent mainly to priests and nuns. And I must admit that the editors of that brainwashing sheet at least have the decency not to refer to themselves any longer as Catholics. They call it information from the conciliar church. This is what we have to decide today. Conciliar or Catholic? And since the establishment of our once Catholic Church has banned me from exercising my chosen career, or my appointed career, I should say, of the priest professor, since there is no room anymore in any so-called Catholic seminary for a conservative theologian and canon lawyer as I am, I still try to keep in practice of teaching. Maybe someday there will be room again for people such as I. So I'm going to bother you this afternoon with a little lecture in church history. Just a matter of keeping up the practice. But the main reason why I like to ask you to go back down a few centuries is simply this. You cannot understand the church of today and you certainly cannot brace yourself properly for the church of tomorrow unless you really are acquainted with the church of yesterday. So as briefly as I can, but once I'm going and I get going, I usually take full advantage of my captive audience, as the cliché goes. At the same time, I hear there are some people here who have to catch a train, so don't feel uh, hesitant at all if you really feel that the train is uh, calling you, you just walk out, you know, and if there are a few spies in the audience, as there always are, maybe they can write that up then next week in a Catholic paper that some people walked out in protest. <laughs> So three points I would like to go over with you, ladies and gentlemen, 
the church yesterday, the church today, and the church tomorrow. Now the church yesterday, we traditionalist Catholics, we still believe, and proudly so, that we are the only church that can trace its origin as far back as our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the incarnate second person of the Blessed Trinity, the only person ever to walk this earth who could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. We also believe that he founded his one true church. We believe that his mandate still holds today, the mandate that sounded, Go ye into the whole world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that not believeth shall be condemned. It almost sounds like extremist radical language, doesn't it? Before ascending into heaven, after his resurrection, in which we Catholic traditionalists also still believe, he left his church here on earth, forever to be guided by the Holy Ghost. Oh yes, I always call him that, you know, he did all right all these centuries, so I still give him the old name. He left his church here forever, forever to be guided by the Holy Ghost, but equally forever to be attacked by the unholy spirit, the spirit of wickedness, until the final day of reckoning. All through the history of our church, generation after generation, had to decide the simple axiom, the simple dilemma, simple but agonizingly acute, for Christ or against Christ. And so as to close the door once and for all, for all the neutralizers of the middle of the road, Christ made it clear that he who is not with me is against me. But he also made it clear that those who are with him will have him on their side forever. I am with you till the end of time. And the words of our Lord were still echoing through Palestine when St. Paul was really the first one to put out an official God-inspired warning against the infiltrators that were already there within the ranks of the early Christians. When he wrote to the Ephesians, Brethren, be strengthened in the Lord and in the might of his power. Put you on the armor of God that you may be able to stand against the deceits of the devil. For our fight, he continued, is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the spirits of wickedness in the high places. And so that no one would make an appeal to a misunderstood law of obedience and listening to those that are sitting in the high chair of authority, St. Paul again gave us an, extra, an excellent and extremely valuable guideline to go by when he wrote to the Galatians, quote, even if an angel from heaven should preach a gospel to you other than that which we have preached to you, let him be damned, unquote. And then the next stage in our history that carries some well worthwhile implications for our present day were the centuries of the persecutions, the bloody persecutions from without. They ended when Emperor Constantine gave the world what became known as the Edict of Milan, when the enemy from without was beaten and good, but the enemy from within was not. And came the fourth century to bring us the first truly organized heretical schism in our church. 
named after a bishop, arise. Arianism, of which the central practical idea must sound quite familiar to you today, because basically what they were selling was this, that Christ is not our God, but our brother. That the church and the world should not fight each other. That the church should open its arms and live happily forever with the powers that be of the world. And the politicians of those days joined the powers that were of the church. And we had the spectacle of the first attempt to what later on became known as aggiornamento. Eighty percent of the bishops became apostates, and the other 20 percent didn't want to rock the boat. And as Saint Jerome wrote later on, one morning the Christian world woke up and it was all heretical and schismatic. It was all alien. And the Pope in those days, by the name of Pope Liberius, first kept quiet try to reconcile things that couldn't be reconciled, truth and error, water and fire. And then for about three years he even joined the apostatic bishops and closed his eyes and his heart and his conscience when the sole lonely voice of opposition, a man named Athanasius, stood alone and fought the powers of the establishment of his days. And it was the laity of the fourth century, the ordinary so-called layman and laywoman, together with a few priests, that saved the true traditional Catholic faith. And three years later, after three years of agony for the loyal traditional Christians of those days, Pope Liberius changed his course of action and joined whatever was left of the true traditional Christian views, the traditional Catholic faith which had been kept alive through sacrifice and through persecution by a handful of Catholic lay people and even a smaller handful of priests. And it is quite interesting that in the long list of popes Beginning with St. Peter, you can start right there, St. Peter, St. Linus, St. Cletus, St. 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 until all of a sudden you hit Liberius and there is no S before his name. The first Pope who didn't make it on the list, he didn't make it to the list of canonized Popes. And it is also quite interesting that the one who was excommunicated under Pope Liberius, Athanasius is now Saint Athanasius, Doctor of the Church. I heard of nice Horatio Alger, uh, you know, uh, and Rax to Riches stories, but from excommunication to sainthood, that beats it all in my book. <laughs> what is the conclusion of this, ladies and gentlemen? The conclusion is an extremely practical one, that even a Pope, and bishops lose their spiritual authority when they cut themselves off from the teachings of their predecessors. And then came the 7th century, and again we have an extremely interesting situation, which I believe, at least in my days, was always very carefully kept hidden in the church history books even up to college. But obviously they didn't hide it during the three years of a postgraduate church history course which I took 20 years ago in what was then the Catholic University of Louvain. Later on I also ended up in what was then the Catholic University of America in Washington DC. Now in the seventh centuries we had the first 
temporary schism between the East and the Western Church. Between the East and the Western Church. If this microphone were in the right spot, we wouldn't have all that trouble. So in the seventh century, a heresy, which basically had to do with the divinity of Christ again, brought us another pope by the name of Honorius, who was pope from 625 to 638. And I'll come back to that later, because the schism didn't go too far, but 40 years later, Pope Honorius I was solemnly anathematized by the Sixth Ecumenical Council of Constantinople. Unbelievable. And anathematizing a dead person, that's the negative equivalent of a canonization. And the reason was because the Pope Honorius I kept quiet when he should have spoken. He himself, the historians tell us, was not at all a heretic. He knew where the truth was, but he did nothing to stop the heretics who were destroying the church, or tried at least. Again, I guess you guessed it, Pope Honorius I never got that S before his name either. In the 11th century, we really had the big first schism, the Eastern schism, which basically came down to this. Is the Pope in Rome the supreme pontiff, as we believe he is, with authority over all Christians, all Catholics, bishops and cardinals and patriarchs included, or is he simple, the chairman of the board, the first among equals? And in those days, the Pope stood up for, not for their own personal rights or for their own personal privileges, but for the papacy. And told the Eastern Patriarchs that if they did not want to recognize the Pope of Rome as the Supreme Pontiff, the Vicar of Christ, the one person with authority over all Catholics, that there was no room for them in the Catholic Church. And that there was only one way, that was the way out. In those days, popes were not willing to sell out their authority. And then in the 16th century, we had the Protestant Reformation, of which we are yesterday, or the day, the week before, and it's still going on, celebrating the 450th anniversary. And as all pseudo-reformers, the Protestant Reformation started by attacking the very heart of the Catholic religion, the liturgy. It was Cardinal Newman who once wrote, if you want to destroy a religion, destroy its central liturgy. And so that you wouldn't think that I'm giving you a biased version of the history of those days, I'll read from a magazine which is usually not too favorably inclined to what I'm doing, Time Magazine. But I must admit that they gave an excellent description of um, what happened during the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. And you just try to compare that to what's happening today. I'm reading here from one of my favorite magazines, Time. At least they spell my name right, you know, so. That's what he said. Luther returned to Wittenberg to put into effect a spiritual reform that became the model for much of Germany. He started by revising the Latin liturgy and translated it into German, allowing the laity to receive the consecrated wine as well as the host, substituting a new popular and vernacular type of religious songs for the traditional Latin Gregorian chant. Emphasis in worship changed from the celebration of the sacrificial mass to the preaching and the teaching of God's word. The sacraments were reduced from seven to two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Meanwhile, the revolt against Rome spread in town after town 
priests removed statues from the churches and abandoned the mass. Clerical celibacy was also abandoned. And in 1525, Luther married a former nun, Catherine von Bora. You don't see what kind of uniform she was wearing at the time. And since there are some good sisters in the audience, I won't see anything more about that uniform. <coughs> now, then, no later on, because believers are not ladies and gentlemen, there are even sisters walking around today in the new breed uniform who detest us as much as you do. And it's a big sacrifice for them to give up the traditional uniform that was so expressive of their dedication to the church. So let's not all condemn them. Maybe someday what they still have in their heart might still prevail. Then we'll later on when an investigating committee reported to Edward VI that 90%, actually the statistics given in England there are 11 twelfths of the English people were still clinging to the Catholic faith of their fathers and were still hoping that the old Catholic religion would be restored, it is then that King Edward VI decided to abolish the Mass. And then we have the famous decision of the King's Reformation Commission of 1547. And that is the decree, ladies and gentlemen, where the tables that are now disgracing our sanctuaries originated. Oh yes, now you new breed clergymen, they tell you that that was all ordered by the Constitution on the liturgy in the Second Vatican Council. Now, believe it or not, but I'm really not the bragging type, but if I may just say that since I was an advisor and attended the Second Vatican Council sessions, maybe I know a little more about it than your new breed clergy in the parishes that are now trying to contradict me. And while I'm not exactly a Rockefeller at this moment, I'll give them any nickel I still have left if they can show me, and I'm not from Missouri, if they can show me where in the Constitution and the liturgy it says that our altars must be replaced with tables. It doesn't say so in the Constitution and the liturgy. That Constitution passed in 1962. It says it in 1547, all right, oh yes. All altars in every church or chapel must be taken down. And instead of them, a table must be set up to move the people from the superstitions of the Popish Mass unto the right use of the Lord's Supper. The use of an altar being to sacrifice upon and the use of a table to eat upon. Altars were erected for the sacrifice, which being now ceased, the form of an altar must cease together with it. And it still didn't go over too well with the good, believing people in Great Britain. And five years later, in 1552, it was necessary to enforce, and literally do so, enforce the second act of uniformity. Quote, so that the simple people may turn from the old superstition of the sacrifice of the Mass to the right use of the Lord's Supper, all altars shall be replaced with tables. The presiding minister, and that turn will come back later on in my talk, the presiding minister must stand not as in the old Mass with his back to the congregation, but facing the congregation so that the people can see. The use of all English texts must also be imposed for the same reason, to emphasize the change in the view taken of the sacrament. And all Catholic bishops but one in the mother country of Great Britain. When I served on the British command at one time during the war, we used to have a joke saying, do you know why they call Britain the mother country? And the answer was, because she is always expecting. <laughs> that wasn't in my text, really. <laughs> That's how we got even with our British officers. 
And then came all, as I said, all Catholic bishops, but one went down the drain and sold out their responsibility and their beliefs, except one, and that's the only one whose name we still remember, Saint John Fisher. And then came modernism in the 19th and the early 20th century. It all started, oh, all these things start in Europe. That's why even today, the desecration of your churches, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't born in an American brain. That was born in the evil brain of modernistic, unbelieving theologians in Western Europe. I should know, I studied with some of them. That's why they hate me, I broke ranks. Thank God. Modernism started in 1816 with an apostate French priest named Lamennais. And here we have really the second formal attempt to aggiornamento. Again the same chestnut they are now selling in our churches. The church should stop fighting the world, but update itself and get involved with the world. There were no pickets and rights in those days, otherwise Lamennais would have been there. In 1834 he was honest enough to make it public that he was no longer believing in the mass and consequently he was no longer going through the motions. That brought him immediate support from some interesting friends, the Freemasons, who supported them quite comfortably and made sure that he was in a position to gather around him a lot of young clergymen who would be very comfortably kept and very well trained to wait for the day of the open attack on the church. One of the quotations there, which sounds as if they are taken out of a modern day Catholic newspaper is, the highest virtue today is not faith. It doesn't matter what you believe, just Love. 1834. Another of his statements, all religions are basically the same, so let's all get together and form a one world religion. 1834. And Rome really works slowly, but there comes a time when a pope gets fed up with certain things. And in 1864, on December the 8th, Pius the 9th came up with an encyclical and a syllabus of errors condemning modernism in every form for all times to come. <laughs> but the modernists did not leave the church. In the past, even men like Luther, they had the decency to quit and leave the church and make it clear that he wanted nothing to do with the Catholic Church. But the modernists didn't have that basic honesty. They were condemned as severely as any heresy ever was, but they didn't leave the Church. They stayed right within the ranks, waiting for an opening to attack the Mother Church from within. And that is why seven years after his solemn condemnation, Pius IX, still had to say, quote, the real scourge of our church is not the one who uses violence and bodily persecution to do the devil's work on earth. The real scourge of our church is the liberal Catholic, unquote, Pius the Ninth. Seven years later, he died, Pius the Ninth, and was succeeded by what would be described, I guess, in today's terms, as liberal Pope Leo the Thirteenth. And out of charity, we will bypass his pontificate as far as doctrine is concerned. Although the man should be remembered as one of the popes who gave us excellent documents in social doctrine, as you know, particularly his Rerum Novarum. But maybe he was a little too much interested in the social aspects of things. And maybe that explains why under his pontificate, the modernists solidified their positions at an alarming rate. 
When Pope Leo XIII died in 1903, the man was 93 years old, and you can figure out yourself how easy it is to abuse an old man who is in his late 80s and in his early 90s. And when he died, the evil spirit behind the throne of Pope Leo XIII was Cardinal Lampola. History clearly states that man's strange connections with anything but religious interests. That man was elected Pope, mind you. But God uses strange ways to keep his church on the right track. In 1903, Christ stepped in to block the election of Rampola to become successor of Peter. And the means, the instrument God used to block that election, believe it or not, was the Emperor of Austria, who still had somewhere in an old legal treatise the veto privilege to veto the election of any pope. And the good, loyal, traditionalist Catholic cardinals left with no other human means to block the election of this ungodly cardinal, the good cardinals appealed to the secular power to block the election. And the emperor of Austria used his legal power to veto that election. The cardinals elected another pope. And obviously the Holy Ghost, who must have been on leave when they were heading in the direction of Rampola, made sure that he took over this time in the election, and an unknown cardinal was elected, a cardinal by the name of Sarto, who became somewhat better known later on as Saint Pius X. It is he who in 1907 solemnly and even more strongly condemned modernism in terms which our present-day Catholic press tries to ignore and tries to deny. The modernists again did not leave the church. Oh no, they stayed right in and joined the same forces that had been joined before. Freemasonry within the Catholic Church was the vehicle to undermine the church from within. And then the next new movement to have the scene, to come on the scene was communism. In 1914, St. Pius X died and World War I had just started. He died 16 days after the beginning of World War I. In 1917, exactly 50 years ago, as you know, the communist revolution took place. In 1917, something maybe of even greater importance took place. The Blessed Mother of God appeared in Fatima, all in the same year. And communism, joining modern techniques and modern money, to all the traditionally used tactics of the devil started to work for his goal of world domination. And the Christians of all denominations, Catholics as well as Protestants, slept while the enemy was not at all sleeping. In 1931, the Lenin School of Political Warfare sent out its secret instructions to its uh, elite of workers, making it clear that in 20 or 30 years, now 31, 30 years added to it, that would make it 61 plus, that in about 30 years, the day would come that international communism would gradually take over the entire world. Communism couldn't do that unless it destroyed religion. And it started to work immediately on our best Protestant denominations, which, with the help of Freemasonry, were infiltrated to the bone. 
And I have been warned not to say that in public if I know what's good for me. And that's why I'm saying it again. <laughs> when in 1933, Hitler took over in Germany, communism found a good excuse to gain respectability. Anyone who was against Hitler at the time was supposed to be respectable. Well, there were a few fools like I was who believed that both Nazism and communism were just two diseases, and we tried to fight both at the time. But in 1933, it became evident that the Protestant denominations had been very successfully infiltrated, but that the Roman Catholic Church was still standing there alone as the big opponent of international communistic atheism. And it is in 1933 that Moscow, its central committee there, ordered the infiltration of the Catholic Church. Because priests did not become communists, communists would now become priests. And the instructions left no doubt that some of the most promising young men, so it said, in communist ranks would be sent to our seminaries to go through all the motions of training for the priesthood and be ordained and try to get up as high as they could in the Catholic Church. This was in 1933, and by the law of average, some of them should have succeeded quite well by now. When those directives reached the Vatican, which at that time had an excellent intelligence service, it's not so good these days, they tell me, when Pius XI became aware of this infiltration plan of atheist to communism, he composed personally, he didn't use ghostwriters, he personally composed this encyclical, De Vina Redemptoris, in which he condemned communism once and for all as intrinsically evil and warned the Catholic bishops of the world against infiltrators within the church. But our bishops sort of smiled and told the man in Rome was getting a little hysterical. Then came World War II and communism became a world power with infiltration its greatest weapon. Still, quite successfully, the subversive forces continued to work to bring Catholicism down to the lowest level of the Protestant Reformation, to bring the Protestant Reformed Churches down to the lowest level of the deformation, where we have now Christian theologians advocating a God is dead theology, and by undermining all Christian denominations to create an emptiness in which atheistic communism would nicely step in someday, as the old gentleman Khrushchev told us point blank when we were dumb enough to be his host here in the United States, total unremitting warfare until the complete globe and every soul is controlled completely by the force known as communism remains our goal today. Whether you like it or not, history is on our side, he said, we will bury you. Well, there have been others to say that before, but just to show that we are knowing what we are talking about, ladies and gentlemen. And again, when Pope Pius XII occupied the chair of St. Peter, a Pope who was maybe one of the best informed supreme pontiffs ever to rule over our church, he knew that the first attack, the first front attack against the Catholic Church would be directed against the liturgy of the Mass. It was in 1947 already that Pope Pius XII warned the bishops against the fanatics of the liturgical and the theological left who were already then beginning to agitate for some of the liturgical abuses and monstrosities which are now hailed as great accomplishments of a revitalized liturgy, but which the saintly Pope in his encyclical Mediator Dei called insidious and very damaging extremes. 
wicked innovations they are preparing, he warned the bishops. Poisonous fruit, he called them. And the advocates of that so-called liturgical renewal were condemned already then as, quote, men leaving the path of sound doctrine. Men who claim to promote the liturgical renaissance, but in reality contaminate the liturgy with errors regarding the Catholic doctrine. I'm still quoting Saintly Pius XII. Men, he said, he warned the bishops against, men who propose wicked innovations and are wrong in appealing to the social nature of the Holy Eucharist. Men, he calls them, who are unsound Catholics, who want to revive customs long eliminated as abuses. Men, he calls them, who want to force upon the people new ways of doing things, new ways that are like poisoned fruits or like infected branches on a healthy tree. Infected branches, he calls them, that should be cut off, unquote, from Pope Pius XII. And knowing how these forces already in 47 were preparing their first front attack on the Latin language in the church, because it was a symbol of our universality with Catholics all over the world, and it was a symbol of our link with Rome, knowing that their first attack would be, as Luther's attack was, against the Latin language of the church, Pope Pius XII told the bishops then, keep your cotton-picking fingers of Latin. He didn't use that word really, but this is what he said. The use of Latin must continue in our church because it is a clear and beautiful sign of unity and, more important, an effective remedy against corruptions of the true doctrine. And also knowing that the next attack would be against the altars, to have them replaced with the monstrosities of ironing boards and tables in 1947 already. Some people think, how could this all happen overnight? It wasn't happening overnight. These modernists have prepared that for years and years. In 1947, Pius XII told the bishops, keep your altars in the churches because, quote, he wanders from the right path who wishes to restore to the altar the ancient form of a table. But our bishop did not listen. And then came the year 1962, with Pope John XXIII occupying the chair of Peter. Good Pope Pope John, Never has the Church known a Pope who was more traditionalist in his doctrine and in his liturgical outlooks than the good Pope John XXIII, who is now being abused to justify the monstrosities which he detested and which he never authorized. Because when good Pope John XXIII convoked the Ecumenical Council for October the 11th of that year, he was told by some of his advisors that he made a mistake in convoking a council which would not be a happy meeting of a couple of weeks, where bishops from all parts of the world would get together, exchange a few niceties, and then jointly make a declaration to the world that the Catholic Church unchanged in its fundamental doctrines, was now willing to make a few adaptations in some non-essential external things. When he was told, for instance, that the first attack of the modernists would be against the traditional Latin liturgy, Pope John XXIII, who took his responsibility when there was need for it, convoked all the cardinals living in Rome and all those living within a reasonable traveling distance, convoked all the bishops living in the same conditions, and ordered them 
to come to Rome on February the 22nd of 1962, eight months before the opening of the Vatican Council, and most solemnly, personally leaving the Vatican to go and stand on top of the grave of St. Peter in Rome, with all the cardinals standing next to him and a score of bishops right underneath there, Pope John declared in the forum of an apostolic constitution, which is the highest forum of papal intervention next to an infallible dogma definition, he declared that there was one thing no council and no bishop could ever touch, the traditional Latin liturgy. He came out on that February the 2nd, the Feast of St. Peter's Chair, he selected just for that, with the Constitution Vetrum Sapientia, and made it clear that this wasn't just a quick talk from the Pope. He made it clear, quote, in the full awareness of our office and of our authority, we decree an order a perpetuum re memoriam, in perpetuity, he said, we will and command that this our constitution remain firmly established and ratified, notwithstanding anything to the contrary. And that constitution said that Latin had to stay in the liturgy and that the bishops had the obligation to see to it that no one under their authority works for the elimination of Latin from either the liturgy or the studies for the priesthood in our seminaries. That was eight months before the Vatican Council opened. And the Pope made it clear that this was a perpetuum re memoriam and all perpetuity. This must remain in the fullness of our authority. We make this decision, he said, and he made it quite clear why. Quote from good old Pope John XXIII, a universal religion needs a universal language. Where are our bishops today? And it is in that year, 1962, that the stigmatic, heretical, conciliar sect of the church, the conciliar church in the United States of America was born. Why? Because regardless of the clear, solemn orders of Pope John XXIII, the, the majority of our American bishops refused to obey it. I should know because I was dean of the faculty at the time, and I got instructions from an archbishop in Baltimore not to implement the Constitution from Rome. That's when I resigned as Dean of the Faculty. <laughs> and it is that day that the majority of our bishops automatically excommunicated themselves from our Roman Catholic Church. Now they try to threaten me with excommunication. I would consider it the highest honor to be illegally excommunicated by men who were excommunicated five years ago. <laughs> well, because the instructions they sent out to people such as I was in that position was, pay no attention to that old, I won't quote it, what they called good old Pope John, pay no attention we will wait until the, con the council convenes and we will get rid of that Latin liturgy fast. So just wait. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if we are still living in a church that believes in its code of canon law, and if you believe Pope Paul VI, then we still do, then canon 2332 of our code of canon law makes it so clear where the Sheehans and the Dearmans and the Codys are since 1962. Quote, each and every one of whatsoever position or rank, whether king, bishop or cardinal, who appeals from the laws, decrees or mandates of the reigning Roman pontiff to an ecumenical council, 
is suspected of heresy and incurs automatic excommunication, unquote. And the following canon just elaborates a little. Persons, and that goes for priests too now, who try to hide behind this misunderstood vow of obedience, carrying out illegal instructions from illegal bishops. Persons, quote, persons who directly or indirectly prevent the implementation of acts issued by the apostolic see incur automatic excommunication, canon 2333. And you didn't have to be a doctor of canon law to understand that language. 1962 was the first step in the establishment of the schismatic heretical conciliar sect, which is now posing as the Catholic Church establishment in the United States. Because now we are faced with conciliarism. Pope John XXIII convoked his Vatican Council. And ladies and gentlemen, let no one tell you that I personally, or the Catholic traditionalist movement, are fighting the decisions of the Ecumenical Council. Oh no, we are not. No Catholic could. What we are fighting today are the false interpretations of the Second Vatican Council. And it is high time, as we asked our Holy Father to do in the letter we sent him on August the 15th, it is high time for the present Holy Father to declare that the Vatican Council was a big mistake and that it is now completely eradicated from the records. He could do it. He is the Pope. <laughs> and it isn't just to the credit of that good Pope John XXIII, but it is even more so to the credit of the Holy Ghost, that Pope John XXIII made it crystal clear from the very beginning when he convoked that council, and I should know I heard him say it. Yes, he said it in Latin but I still understand a little Latin. He made it clear that unlike all previous ecumenical councils, the Second Vatican Council was to be not a doctrinal council, but a pastoral one, leaving the door open for any subsequent pope to just say, basta, and that's Italian vernacular. <laughs> And when it became clear that the Second Vatican Council was heading, humanly speaking, for destruction, God stepped in and closed the Vatican Council. When I returned to the United States after the first session, I told my friends I had seen Pope John the day before I left Rome. I said, that Pope will not open any other sessions. That man is dying. For once, my predictions came true. I have made a few others that came true, incidentally. But the man died, an act of God ended the Second Vatican Council, which had, at that time, not made any decisions, any decrees whatsoever. The first session, 1962, ended, and no second session came because Pope John died. Now, under the existing law of our church, an ecumenical council is automatically closed, ended, when the reigning supreme pontiff dies. An act of God closed an ecumenical council. And many a church observer was hoping that when the new pope was elected, he would not reopen a council which had been closed by an outspoken unmistakably clear act of God. But already listening to some of his advisors, Pope Paul VI did not convoke a third Vatican Council, which would have been more in line with the traditions, but he reopened the second Vatican Council, which had been closed. And I was not the only one to be a little bit uncomfortable when you were witnessing something that amounted to a council closed by an act of God, reopened by an act of man. 
But nevertheless, when the final session closed of the Second Vatican Council, every decision and every decree that officially was promulgated by it contained nothing but the traditional sound doctrine of our church. Oh yes, I had heard proposals made there. You wouldn't believe them. Bishops proposing there as acceptable Catholic doctrine. Heresies, dogmatic and moral heresies, which had been condemned centuries ago. But they were not made law. Oh no. Christ who is with his church and the Holy Ghost who still steers the bark of Peter did not permit those proposals to be accepted. But what we are witnessing today, ladies and gentlemen, are precisely those defeated proposals which are now being forced down the throat of our Catholic people. The modernists couldn't get it done legally at, in Rome. Now they are trying to do it illegally, and that's why we are fighting them. Because today, Because today we have the exact carbon copy of the situation St. Pius X described in 1903, where he made it clear that the promoters of error today are not found among our declared enemies. The promoters of error today are found in the very ranks of our own church. Today we are witnessing exactly that same situation. We are also witnessing the very thing which was predicted in Fatima in 1917. And I could see why the Pope is not exactly making that public. But I don't pretend to have the whole text of that message of our Blessed Mother in Fatima. But the text I received in Rome has a few paragraphs in there which are still very much of interest. It was predicted then and it is happening now. A time of severe trial is coming for the church. Not today nor tomorrow, the Blessed Mother said in 1917, but in the second half of the 20th century. Humanity will not develop as God desires it. Mankind will become sacrilegious and trample underfoot the gift it has received. No longer will order reign anywhere. Even in the highest places, the Blessed Mother predicted, Satan will reign and direct the course of things. He will even succeed in infiltrating into the highest positions in the church. Cardinals will oppose cardinals and bishops will oppose bishops. Satan will enter into their very midst. The church will be obscured and all the world will be thrown into confusion. It takes the mother of God to give us such a description, ladies and gentlemen. And that is why we wrote to the Holy Father, not attacking the Pope as the false brethren of the so-called conservative Catholic press have tried to make its readers believe. We didn't attack the Pope in our letter to him. There isn't a priest in the whole world who has more loyalty and more affection to the present Pope than I do. Because if for no other reason, Pope Paul VI didn't have to give me the personal attention and the personal affection he showed me when he gave me a personal audience and blessed the work I have been doing the last two weeks. I cannot forget that, unhappy as I am, about some of the things his advisors make him do today. What we asked Holy, the Holy Father in my letter of August the 15th, and if you are interested in the full text, just leave your name and we'll gladly send you a copy. We asked the Holy Father to please be a Pope, to act like a Pope, to stand on his own two feet and give us loyal traditionalist Catholics the satisfaction of being able once more to say, Rome has spoken and all Catholics will obey. That's what we asked him to do. We are not trying to start a new schismatic church, ladies and gentlemen. I have been accused by the phony conservative Catholic press, which is now wandering in all directions, and which is now sending up all sorts of splinter groups, 
some of whom are even exposing themselves to dangerous legal action by twisting Catholic traditionalists and traditionalist Catholics around, or coming up with fancy Latin-sounding terms referring to neutralizing organizations who have already destroyed some of the true traditionalists in Europe. We are not setting up a new set, ladies and gentlemen. I don't want to sound dramatic, but I have been a priest for 25 years of my life. My Catholic Church means more to me than my life. <laughs> to say that I am now leaving the Catholic Church makes less sense than to say that I'm committing suicide this evening. No, ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't leave the Catholic Church even if I tried. It's too much in me. I haven't been training priests for the last 15 years because I had to do it. I could have made a very comfortable living like the rest of my family has done. I didn't become a priest to dodge the draft. I served four years in the war. I didn't become a priest because I flunked in college. I became a priest because I thought that God had elected me to do his work. To leave the church for me is just unthinkable. We are not trying to set up a new little church. We are desperately trying to hold down to the old church or whatever is left of it. And it doesn't matter.